Lecture 16, Crossbeam and Rayon. In previous courses, such as a concurrency course, you have to do everything the hard way. Write your own. All of your answers are right, but you didn't do it the hard way. Zero points. Uh, I uh, may have had a bad experience with this in, uh, in high school. Maybe. Um, that's not super realistic. Um, in this course and in industry, such restrictions don't really apply. Uh, you'll use libraries that have appropriate functionality, assuming that the license for them is acceptable to your project. I mean, you don't want to uh, you start using a library that requires open sourcing all of your code if that's uh, incompatible uh, with what you uh, will be doing uh, as a company. But if it is just something that uh, you know has a license that is uh, more uh, appropriate, then by all means. Um, two of the uh, things that we're going to talk about in this topic uh, are Crossbeam and Rayon, unsurprisingly, considering what this is called. Uh, and these are both Apache licensed, so that's pretty permissive. It should pose no issue. In the previous version of this course, um, when we taught it in C and C++, um, we used uh, the OpenMP functionality uh, in which we would direct the compiler to parallelize things. Uh, and uh, it was in the context of we have a problem and we want to parallelize it and we can use OpenMP directives uh, to accomplish the work that we would normally do by writing all the pthread stuff manually, which, you know, the... OpenMP directives are a lot more concise, uh, although perhaps give you slightly less control. The same idea applies here to what we're going to do today. Uh, it's just using the crossbeam and rayon crates instead of compiler directives, and we can take advantage of things that people have already written for us so that we do not have to reinvent the wheel. We're going to start with crossbeam. You will recall from earlier, uh, I was working on a very simple thread example that looked like this, where it said, okay, we're going to create a vector, and we're going to then uh, try to print something uh, in the vector, uh, in, the, uh, in the thread. Uh, and, well, that wasn't okay, because the lifetime of vector v was a problem. And for that situation, we used the arc type. Uh, we could also get around it by moving the vector into the thread, returning it again if we need it, uh, but we didn't necessarily do that, and if we're sharing something, we use the mutex around it with the archetype wrapping the mutex, which wraps the vector. Okay, we could do that, but it's a bit of a pain if the thread is going to be short-lived. Crossbeam gives us the ability to create scoped threads. And scope is like a little container that we are going to put our threads in, allowing the compiler to be convinced that a thread will be joined before leaving the scope. So let's look at something like this. Uh, obviously, we have to uh, use the crossbeam crate for this to work, but uh, ultimately that's no big issue. Uh, and then we can say that we want to create a scope. We're going to call it scope very surprising. Super original name, 10 out of 10. Uh, and in that, uh, we are going to put our print line statement that says, okay, here's a vector. Uh, and we will then uh, unwrap afterwards saying, all right, uh, we're going to assume that uh, creating the uh, scope has worked, uh, and then uh, we will have another print line that says vector v is back. Comparing against the previous code, I mean, the problem that we faced is that after the handle.join.unwrap call, we couldn't say vector v is back because it was moved into the thread, uh, and ownership went in there, and it didn't come back uh, because, well, we you know, were assuming that the thread could live arbitrarily long, and we don't know what's going to happen. So does this work? Um, well, if I add some additional stuff to the uh, print statement, so it tells you the thread ID, I get this. Main thread has an ID uh, and then a big long number. Here's a vector, one, two, three. Uh, now in thread with ID, the same one as main. And then vector V is back. Um, so do you ever have the feeling that maybe you forgot to do something important? Uh... I, uh, I think from the picture that might be a BMW X5 uh, that is uh, cur currently uh, getting some snow in it. Uh, I would not like to be the owner of that particular vehicle. Uh, I can't imagine it would uh, take too well to being uh, 
filled up with snow, especially when the snow melts and gets on and in everything. But I don't know. Uh, I never owned a BMW, so I wouldn't know. Okay, um, yeah, what did we forget? We, we made the container, but we didn't actually create any threads. So let's try that again. Uh, so let's do that now where we're actually spawning a thread in there. And so inside our scope, we say scope.spawn, uh, and we create another inner scope. That's the scope of the thread itself. Here's a vector, the print statement saying here's our thread ID, uh, and then vector is back. All right, um, we can see obviously that uh, this works better. The output says now main thread has some ID. Here's the vector one, two, three is printed by the other thread because we're in that other thread and we can tell it's a different one because it has a different ID, which is everything we wished and hoped for. And we can even say vector V is back uh, because well, ultimately um, we have convinced the compiler that because the thread that we're creating in scope.spawn is within the scope of this crossbeam scope, we are certain that the thread will end before the crossbeam scope does. So we've put it in a little container. There are still rules, of course. Um, the, you know, there's no free-for-all, and the Rust compiler still has to be effectively convinced that what we're doing is correct and makes sense. Uh, and in this case, adding the container ensures that everything is, uh, is within a fixed, limited scope. So when we create a thread inside the scope created on, uh, on the third statement there, crossbeam scope resolution scope, uh, it means anything that happens in there will have finished by the time this scope ends. That's different from just creating a thread as it is, because our normal conception of the potential lifetime of a thread is, well, it could be immortal. I mean, it probably isn't, but it could be immortal, so we have to account for that possibility. Now, by putting it in this container, we're saying it can never be longer than the lifetime of this container, meaning anything that we send in there, we could eventually get back. All right, I said there are still rules, and that is, of course, still true. We cannot borrow the vector mutably into two threads in the same scope. That would introduce the potential for race condition, and that's just not permitted. Um, but what's nice about this is that it reduces the amount of ceremony that's required for passing data back and forth. We don't have to explicitly add every parameter to the return types of the uh, function, uh, nor do we have to put a mutex uh, on everything or put it in atomic reference counts or clone everything as necessary. It really makes it straightforward to have something that's used in another thread and then returned afterwards. Another thing that we can do with um, the uh, with Rust and uh, Crossbeam Crate is that um, Rust says use message passing, but also Rust doesn't give you a multiple producer, multiple consumer channel. That makes it hard to do something like a standard implementation of the producer consumer problem, the kind of thing that we have done lots of times uh, in previous examples. Uh, and um, I mean, we've talked about multiple producer and multiple consumer, hopefully in a previous concurrency course. Uh, and I even showed a code example of that in a previous lecture, but it used the mutex approach. Uh, although we use the mutex approach mostly because I wanted to show you the impact uh, of dropping the mutex guard sooner rather than later. The good news is that Crossbeam gives us a multiple producer, multiple consumer channel. And so we want to make that our method for doing the multi-consumer, multi-producer problem. Uh, and so we defined a shared buffer structure and I use semaphores and a mutex to coordinate access, but we can get rid of all of that uh, and no longer risk getting it wrong when we drop the mutex, which in this case wrong means lower performance and not, oh no, you know, there is a race condition kind of getting it wrong. So if we want to create a channel, um, then we do so using bounded, uh, and there does exist an unbounded channel, but um, for the sake of the example, we want the uh, capacity to be bounded in that it has a fixed capacity of 
channel capacity. Uh, and we will then uh, get back a send end and a receive end. Uh, and I'm going to wrap both of those in an atomic reference count so we can hand them out to the various threads. Okay, straightforward so far. Uh, and a, a nice use of the uh, shadowing feature so that we don't have to come up with new names for send end and receive end in this case. Um, now, we're using the bounded channel. It does have a maximum capacity, and if it's full, if our channel capacity is 100, the same as it was before, if there are 100 items in there to consume, then a sender is going to be blocked until such time as space becomes available. We could choose instead the unbounded channel, um, which allows an arbitrary number uh, at a time. However, um, the messages have to go somewhere. Um, so uncollected messages still take up space in memory, and memory is not infinite, but it is close. Uh, nevertheless, it is um, still, for the example, for it to be an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, correct for us to use a bounded channel. Uh, and we'll see later on that actually using a bounded channel is probably good to limit uh, maximum resources. All right, so if we take a look at our consumer code, um, then it is actually significantly simpler than it used to be. Uh, so on each thread, uh, we're going to um, well, we'll clone the uh, receiver end for it because it's a consumer, so it receives. Uh, and then uh, all we're going to do is take the item from the channel, if there's anything to receive, uh, and then consume it. It's a lot cleaner, uh, but is it faster? Well, the original uh, producer-consumer optimized version takes 372 milliseconds to run for our uh, 10,000 items, uh, and the version with the channels takes 232 milliseconds. Uh, so let's actually take a quick look through the whole code, and you can compare them one-to-one. -one. Right. This is the producer-consumer uh, code with the optimization of dropping the... Uh, mutex guard sooner uh, and as you can see not much really has changed um, we have a you know, buffer size uh, of uh, 100 uh, and uh, 10,000 items per thread uh, and four threads we have our shared buffer construct uh, and as before you know, here is creating a producer we clone our spaces and item semaphores we you know, put everything uh, into that thread, uh, and then our thread does the loop, produce the item, block on spaces acquire, then uh, get the uh, mutex lock for the buffer, uh, and get the place where we're going to produce, insert into the buffer, uh, and then uh, add permits, forget, we're done. Same for the consumer. Later on, uh, we will have the opportunity, once we uh, introduce uh, profiling tools, to actually look and see where our time is going, which might give us some hints as to why one version of this is faster than the other. But let's go over to the version where we use the channel and see how much simpler and shorter it is. Okay, and producing an item in, is much shorter and consuming an item is also much shorter because, well, there's really not too much to do here. Um, in, in this case, um, I've uh, actually changed it for the, for the sake of a test uh, on using the bounded capacity, but uh, ultimately we can uh, give this a try. Uh, we'll do five runs, it's fast. The warm-up run is especially important when doing these kinds of things because the uh, first run-through might actually result in compiling it. Okay. Well, nevertheless, we've got uh, something that runs pretty quick here. Uh, the uh, exact figures, of course, vary a lot depending on uh, how many items we have here. It's now 10,000 items per thread as opposed to 10,000 items total. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it is very helpful to be able to just write the code in a simpler way and make use of the channel because we don't need uh, a whole bunch of things that were in the previous code. We don't need the semaphores. We don't need the mutex. We don't need the uh, atomic reference counts that wrap either of those. Um, we 
just say, hey, give me an item. Uh, we don't have to manage it ourselves. We can't forget to call the forget on permits. We don't have to create a shared buffer structure because it's all managed for you inside the bounded uh, channel. Uh, we don't have to manually calculate the offset that we're going to receive from or read from. Uh, we don't have to manually calculate the offset that we're going to read to. It's really convenient in this regard. So, yeah, use libraries wisely. Another small thing that Crossbeam enables is exponential backoff. If you are attempting to access some resource, you should build in the idea that that resource might not be available right now. In particular, uh, if you are calling some REST API on a, uh, a remote server, it's entirely possible that that service is very busy right now and is unable to respond to your request uh, and you might get an error. Uh, and um, that error might not be fatal. It might not be, oh, there's something horribly wrong with your request and it cannot be fulfilled. It might be the case that actually just, you know, the service is over capacity right now and can't respond. If that's the case, don't have a tight loop that simply retries as fast as possible. If the service that you are querying is overloaded, then retrying again as fast as possible is, well, making the problem worse, right? You are adding more load to the service, and what you should actually be doing is waiting and try again. And best practice, as far as I can understand in this arena is that you should do an exponential back off. So you wait a little bit and try again, and if you still get an error next time, you wait longer. In fact, the wait time is supposed to grow exponentially so that you know, the time that you are waiting uh, gets longer and longer and longer the more errors you have, thus giving the service more time to recover. Repeatedly retrying. Uh, in other circumstances, even if it's not just that the thing is overloaded, doesn't help. If it's down for maintenance, it could be quite a while before it's back. So trying 5 million requests for the during the one hour that it's down is not helpful, and you're just wasting your own time. Uh, and, you know, that's effort intensive. Uh, and again, if the resource is overloaded, you are potentially making it worse. So what you want is the more failures that have occurred, the longer the wait, giving the service a chance to recover. Eventually, uh, your exponential backoff you know, is, is not forever. You don't want to have, oh, well, we've decided our exponential backoff is we're now going to wait six years before we try again. Um, that's not a good solution either. At some point, you conclude there's no point in further retries. Block the thread, return an error, or something like that, but set a cap on the maximum retry values before you say that uh, this isn't working. The utility for this in Crossbeam is called Backoff. Naming things is hard. This is a good name. Uh, and each step of the backoff takes about double the amount of time of the previous up to a certain maximum. So it's not quite exponential backoff, but it is a backoff uh, where it does get longer between attempts. So here's the concept of a uh, backoff in a lock free loop. Uh, what we'll do is we're trying to you know, do an operation with compare and swap, and if we are unsuccessful, uh, then uh, we want to give a, a little pause so that other things can happen. Um, so we'll declare our backoff uh, as let backoff is equal to backoff, and then uh, it's constructor new, uh, and we will do a load of A uh, with sequential consistency, uh, and we'll try to do compare and swap on A to the uh, new value. So uh, we're going to expect the old value to be what we just previously loaded, and then we're going to try to do multiplication with B. Uh, and uh, then, again, sequential consistency ordering, please and thank you. Uh, and everything worked correctly, then we return the old value. If not, we do the backoff.spin function. Um, spin function is used because we can try again immediately. We can do so because if the compare and swap operation failed, it's because another thread, another something, uh, did a compare and swap operation or other atomic operation and got a chance to run. Um, and that's okay, it just means we can try again immediately, uh, and doing a spin here does maybe give somebody else a chance, but it also allows us to proceed uh, as quickly as possible. 
if what we actually need is to wait for another thread to take its turn before we go, like we're trying to enter a critical section that's managed using an atomic boolean, uh, we don't want to spin, we want to snooze. It means wait longer, not just like a little tiny bit of time, but actually like wait longer. Um, and so if uh, we do that well, you know, not ready, then we do the call to back off dot snooze. In both cases, whether you have the back off, um, it has a function is completed, which returns true if the maximum back off time has been reached. That is, we've had the maximum number of unsuccessful attempts. Um, and if you uh, respect this, then it means you know, if we're having a hard time accomplishing a task and we just give up, uh, that's better than constantly retrying something that is hopeless. Uh, the existing back off. Uh, class or instance that you have created can be reset with the unsurprisingly named reset function so you don't have to spawn a new one every single time uh, even though you may wish to uh, if that is sensible but um, looking over the uh, code in the crossbeam back off because I decided I would give it a read to try to understand uh, and see what's going on um, I think they forgot something I think they forgot jitter Okay, what, what is that about? Um, jitter is a little tiny bit of randomness added to your back off. Uh, it, it is, however, not this. Um, here's, here's an OK Boomer meme. Um, maybe uh, somebody gets it. No. Um, okay, what is, what is jitter? Jitter is a little bit of randomness. Um, it prevents threads or callers from retrying at the exact same time. I once wrote a little program that tried synchronizing its threads via the database uh, and had exponential back off if the thread in question did not successfully lock the item in the data, uh, database that it wants. Um, and I got lots of warnings that were printed to the console about failing to lock until I added a little bit of randomness to the sleep time that each thread took. And that makes sense. Um, if you have two threads that fail very close together at time x, they will both retry at, say, time x plus 5, uh, where 5 is uh, milliseconds or microseconds or something. Uh, they just fight once again over locking the same row in the database. I added a little bit of randomness, so if one thread retries at x plus 5, and one at x plus 7, and one at x plus 9, they all get different rows in the database, because the little tiny bit of delay means they're not fighting over the same one and saying it's mine, and then the other threads go, oh no, I was unsuccessful in locking it, and I have to retry again. So jitter is actually helpful, and if I found myself possessed of the extra time, I would probably think about submitting a pull request to uh, Crossbeam to suggest having an option for it. Maybe not, you know, maybe not make it the standard, uh, but maybe back off with jitter uh, as an option. Uh, and this kind of thing is very good in the scenario where you have a lot of independent clients accessing the same resource. So you have different threads that are all trying to talk to the database. You have different clients that are trying to call a REST API over the internet. Something like that, uh, it prevents too much uh, synchronous behavior where many threads are trying all at the same time and they end up all fighting uh, because only one of them can win at a time and they all are doing the exact same thing at the exact same moment. If this is making you think of the dining philosophers, um, then, you know, Good. I'm, I'm glad that stuck in your brain. Um, the exponential back off with jitter strategy is very good for that scenario, but is not as good for a scenario where we have one client accessing a resource lots of times. Uh, if you have that, so there's only one thread, but we're doing a lot of querying of the same REST API and we're the only consumer of that API, then you might actually want something else that resembles TCP congestion control. That is a very complicated subject. You might have talked about it in a networking class. It is beyond the scope of what I want to talk about here today uh, because it is, again, it's its own complicated subject uh, and could be a lecture all its own one day. Uh, but for the moment, just keep in mind there are certain limitations uh, and the notes link uh, a, a source on an explanation of TCP congestion control if it is perhaps something that you need.